Welcome to LNK. I'm Dale Johnson. Thanks for being here with us as we talk all things Lincoln Fire and Rescue. Every month we take you into the world of Lincoln Fire and Rescue. Our subject specific conversation today is about handling strokes and we'll get to that in just a moment. That's coming up on LFR on LNK. After we give some huge props to emergency medical services. May 15th through the 23rd is National EMS Week. You might be watching us a week before, a week during, or a week after. The month of May, think of that as Emergency Medical Services uh, Week or month. But think of every opportunity that you have to uh, give props to someone who is in the emergency medical field because they work quickly, they work efficiently, and they have to deal with many diverse responsibilities, everything from accidents to crashes to emergencies. Now for me, my thoughts about emergency crews, paramedics, and EMTs turns to uh, March, the first day of spring in 2016, a motorcycle crash at 27th and Stockwell. Uh, Station 8 responded, Station 4 responded, so the crews at 17th and Van Dorn and the crews from 27th and Old Cheney responded. They got there, they acted quickly, tourniquet on my leg, and I learned later that because of the speed and the efficiency of the EMTs and the paramedics that I was three minutes from bleeding out. Now think of that, three minutes. That is about the amount of time that it takes when you pull up to a gas pump, get out and fill your vehicle, put the hose back at the pump, get in and drive off. That's about three minutes. That's how long I had, had it not been for the fast action of the EMT. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very fond guy of emergency uh, crews here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Forever grateful, by the way. So now, the subject of strokes. Every 40 seconds, someone in this country has a stroke. Every three and a half minutes, someone dies of a stroke. Every year, more than 795,000 people in this country have a stroke. That is almost three times the population of Lincoln. Stroke protocol is included in LFR's 90-page paramedic treatment protocol. We'll go through all 90 pages today. <laughs> if you don't. No, we won't. We're going to go through page 47 in this 90-page protocol with experts today. Nancy Christ is here representing Lincoln Fire and Rescue. She's Public Information Officer, Captain Nancy Christ. Hello there, Nancy. Good Hi. to see you again. Always. And our special guest on the program is Hanna Belden. Hanna is Stroke Program Coordinator at CHI St. Elizabeth. Hanna, welcome in. Thanks for having me. All right, let's start with the description of a stroke. Sure. Do they all look the same? They do not, um, but they all are causing the same problem. So there's a disruption to the blood supply to the brain. And there's basically two main reasons that you have a disruption in that blood supply to the brain. You can get a clot in that blood vessel that's feeding the brain tissue. We call that an ischemic stroke. And that is the most common type of stroke that someone can suffer. About 80% of all strokes will be from an ischemic event or a clot. Um, you can also have a stroke because of a rupturing of the blood vessel. So the blood is not being delivered where it needs to and instead may be leaking into the brain tissue or surrounding the brain um, within the skull. All cause similar deficits though, presenting the same way in how the patient may feel with a few little differences. But the problem that a stroke causes is not getting the, the nutrient rich blood to the brain that it needs to do its job. Is a stroke necessarily painful? Because, and the reason I ask that, Hannah and Nancy, is because people can function during a stroke. Some can. Right. I'm guessing some are more debilitating than others, Nancy? Absolutely. And, you know, one of the markers for us is kind of um, the pain versus no pain, truly. Mm. Um, you know, often it, with an ischemic stroke, uh, I, at least in my experience, uh, there was not a lot of pain. Um, but with a, a hemorrhagic stroke uh, or the bleeding of, in the brain, um, that creates a severe headache or can create a severe headache. So that's kind of one of the differential diagnoses for us in the field. Is Nebraska Nebraskans... Are they the conscientious type of folks to get on the phone and call 911 right away? 
<laughs> so, <laughs> you're, you're both smiling. Uh, we've done a lot of research. Um, part of the American Heart Association has a specific uh, project called Mission Lifeline that they work in collaboration with EMS and the hospitals. And we really focus on our rural parts of Nebraska and our critical access areas as well. And we know in some of that data that they have found that these patients that come in, especially from rural settings, don't call 911 for various reasons. You know, sometimes they're still working and they are able to keep working, so they just keep going. Sometimes they'll go home and take a nap and hope when they wake up it will resolve. And then oftentimes they will drive themselves. I don't feel like they want to burden um, our EMS partners. Nancy, we've talked about how minutes count for all medical calls, not just for strokes. So if a call is delayed or help is delayed, what either time frame or what happens the longer well, it takes to get medical attention? Uh, I mean, time is brain. Right. And um, the sooner that it's recognized and the sooner that they call 911, let us get there, let us begin that patient care, we can, we can do some of the um, evaluations right there in their home and get the ball rolling, alert the hospitals, both um, St. Elizabeth and Bryan uh, group, uh, we can we can call them and let them know that that we have a patient that's experiencing stroke symptoms, um, and they'll be waiting for us when we walk through the door. They literally will be standing there waiting for us, and then the patient goes directly back to the CT scanner. All right, take us to the field. The the EMTs, the paramedics, they're knocking at the door. The call for service is made. Mm -hmm. Where do you start? Well, just as any assessment starts, we begin an evaluation and assessment on the patient. We begin talking to the patient. We talk to the family members. We do assessments. There are a lot of things that mimic a stroke. For instance, uh, low blood sugar, or maybe even heat exhaustion. We're moving into the summer months. Um, drug overdose. There are a lot of things that are, that are, that are mimics to a, a stroke. So we will do evaluations to rule some of those things out. Um, for instance, we'll check for a blood glucose, um, and, and we'll check for those different things, and then we'll do a Cincinnati stroke scale right there in the field, and we're able to then determine, okay, this is the route we're going, and for us, you know, we call it, you know, we go ahead and, and make it a stroke alert, and then get them into the hospital as quickly as possible, and then these guys take over, and you know, sometimes it, it happens that it doesn't end up being a stroke, but that's okay. We're always going to err on the side of caution for the patient every time. So if it looks like a stroke, walks like a stroke, we're going we're gonna to make it a stroke alert. Circle back. The Cincinnati mm -hmm. what? Cincinnati stroke scale. And Tell I'll, I'll let, I'll let um, Hannah take over because I know that <laughs> she really wants to talk about that FAST program for right. our, our viewers. Right, so the Cincinnati scale that she's referring to has been around for a long time um, with pre-hospital uh, evaluations, but we really have pushed to have our community know the same thing, which is FAST. It's the, it's the mnemonic that we use for people to keep in the forefront of their, of their minds. And most people do uh, think of those symptoms with a stroke. So face can be a facial weakness, or we might see a facial drooping. Sometimes you only catch it because maybe a loved one's coffee is dribbling out of one side of their mouth. It can be subtle to extreme. Um, the A stands for arms or asymmetry. We use both of those terms, but you can see a weakness of one, one limb um, or both limbs. But we use the A for arms to help with that or an asymmetry. Uh, S for fast, we use for speech. We have slurring of speech a lot with some of these bigger strokes that we see. And then we've kind of modified the T a little bit um, to fast. Time is what it's for uh, in the mnemonic that American Heart puts out. We also say think about thunderclap headaches. So these are headaches unfamiliar mm. to the patient, sudden onset and extreme and different than anything they've experienced because, as Nancy mentioned, that can be a, a hallmark sign of a hemorrhagic stroke. It's easy to do. All you have to do, it, there it is right there. You can, you can scroll up F-A-C-F-A -F -A fast right there. Yep. It's easy to find stroke.org yeah, is a place to go to great find resource, that. Yep. All right, now the EMTs, the paramedics in the field have determined that it's a stroke mm -hmm. and it looks like a stroke and it's walking like a stroke. They call it a stroke. They, you, you cart the patient into the unit yep. and what happens en route? Why is it so important? And the reason we bring this up so often, Nancy, is that LFR does things that not all emergency mm -hmm. systems do 
as a little bit more insurance to save the life of the patient. So go yep. second by second as you're going from the site of the call to the hospital. So it, this, as soon as we recognize that it's a stroke alert patient, and that may be recognized by our engine company that's there first. You know, those engine companies get there between three and four minutes. So they may recognize immediately that it's a stroke alert. They may call the medic on the medic unit and say, hey, we've got a stroke alert. So they're already thinking, okay, we've got to move. Um, so as soon as we get there, determine that it's a stroke, we start uh, making the phone call to the hospital. Um, you know, the hospital wants to know time of onset. They want to know what their symptoms are. They want to know if they have a physician here in Lincoln. Um, and they, they want to know what their blood glucose is because, again, that's one of those mimic um, pieces. Um, and then the stroke scale test. They want to know what findings we are seeing in the field that we're making it a, a stroke alert patient. And then we, we load them up right away and we do everything we can en route. Like the, the IV is started en route. Um, of course, you know, we're, we're usually putting on them on O2 depending on their o, O2 saturation. We also cardiac, you know, put the cardiac monitor on and we always monitor patients um, that, that have symptoms of stroke with a cardiac monitor. And so um, we alert them that we're on our way and then they bring a team right to what is called a stroke stop um, it's right there in the emergency department, and then they take the patient directly back to the CT scan. They do an evaluation. I think that the neurologist is usually there along with their team, and they take the patient right back. All right, it's handed off to you on how <laughs> does what they've done in the field help you at your end? Yeah, um, the EMS piece to stroke care is, we call it the linchpin. It's, it's critical, it's a critical component. She mentioned, you know, not just letting us know they're coming because that allows us to get all of those team members in place and ready to act quickly, um, but they do things like start an IV. Um, there's, there's not a whole lot of treatment options out there for a stroke once it's happened. Uh, really the fight needs to be on the front end of preventing strokes. We know about 80% of strokes are preventable. But once they've suffered a stroke event and they're coming in, we have a drug that we can give if it's a, a stroke that's been caused from a clot in those vessels. We call it a clot busting drug, um, but it's we need an IV to give it. So that's more time on our end if we have to stop and do that IV versus if EMS brings them in and they've had an opportunity to do that for us, it's less time for that patient. Uh, 1.9 million brain cells are lost a minute during a stroke. So it literally is very time sensitive, very time critical. And that drug's only able to be delivered for a certain amount of time um, of the, from the onset of that patient's symptoms. So we really are moving just as quickly as possible. Not all strokes are fatal. I mentioned oh, deaths yeah, at the beginning. They can be debilitating. They can cause disabilities. It, help me understand the difference. What, what, is, what are the nuances of a stroke where some people it's fatal, right. others they can get up and leave and lead normal lives. Right. And then there's the in-between. Correct. Yeah, there is a broad range. So a term that's become kind of mainstream in the stroke world is called large vessel occlusion. So these are those bigger vessels that are feeding into your brain, and then they split off into smaller vessels as you go on through the brain. Um, so with those larger vessels, there's also services that hospitals can provide called thrombectomies, where they actually go in with the wire and pull those clots out of the brain. But obviously a bigger vessel that's blocked like that is gonna be a more devastating stroke, and that's typically where you see those face, arm, and speech um, deficits in a patient. There can be some more subtle deficits. At St. Elizabeth's we use um, BFAST for our stroke recognition and so the B and the E in addition to what we just talked about in FAST stands for balance issues or vision changes and that's helping us catch some of those more posterior strokes um, that we don't always think about with just the face, arm, and the speech. But those can be just as disabling for a patient. You, you know, if you can imagine your vision being altered or losing part of a hemisphere of your vision for life, that's a debilitating you know, um, uh, result of your stroke. Um, but they're not all going to be a, a fatality event, though it is mm -hmm. the fifth leading cause of death uh, in the nation. It is a leader for disability. And so when you think about disability and, and the strain that is on healthcare, on that family, um, to have a disability for life. If we can prevent or reverse that potential, that's our goal. My mother had a stroke at 39. Yeah, yeah. Back in 1976. Mm -hmm. She passed away at 82. Wow, <laughs> yeah. So all strokes, That's right. Are, there are stages of them and you, you, can, you can survive, you can walk away and not be affected or you, as in the case of my mother, lost her speech. Yeah. True or how true is it that if the stroke is on the left side of the brain, it impacts the right side of the body? Is that true? 
Yeah, that's that's um, as a general rule, that's that's true. There's of course some nuances to different vessels that may be occluded, but yes, typically if you have a, a left-sided injury to your brain, you'll see that manifest on the right side of the face and the arms and even the legs. Is a person that has a stroke more susceptible to a second one? Yes, 25% of strokes are recurrent strokes. So we really, like I think I mentioned, the modifiable risk factors. So you know, there's some things, yeah, you can't change your age, you can't change your ethnicity, you can't change, you know, some of those things, those are non-modifiable risk factors. But things like obesity, um, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, we can modify those, we can work on those things. And so we really want patients to see their providers, you know, coming out of this pandemic, we know people haven't been seeing their physicians like they may be used to. Um, we want people to get a grip on those modifiable risk factors so where we don't even have to call a LFR for one mm -hmm. of these events if we can if we can prevent it. But I think that number, 80%, is, is pretty staggering, that that's preventable for stroke. Are there tests that can give markers or indicators of a person being more susceptible to a stroke? Yeah, so just those risk factors, you know, that we mentioned are a few of them. Obesity is, is a, a causative factor, um, diabetes, hypertension, um, high cholesterol, all of those things certainly can contribute. When per a person would have a stroke, um, Nancy mentioned they put them on a cardiac monitor when they come into the hospital. There are some cardiac rhythms that you can have that make you more likely to throw a clot. Um, most strokes that are ischemic or a clot in the brain are from a cardioembolic source, something from your heart that's showering off a clot. Um, so yes, having those regular EKGs and tests with your physician can certainly kind of give you some predisposing risk factors for stroke. But just call, right? That could just be our takeaway <laughs> message. Just Fast. call. I think that's the, I think that's really the, the bottom line. You know, um, it, just call nine one one. Even because the thing is, we're going to come out there. We're going to do an evaluation, and if we are, if our findings are, are that that don't meet the criteria, you know, we're gonna we're gonna tell you that. Um, we're, we're probably going to recommend that you go to the hospital mm -hmm. for whatever medical issue is happening, mm -hmm. but just call us. We can do a lot of things and, and help with that decision-making process. Absolutely. Just, just introduce it to yourself by going to stroke.org. There you go. It's that easy, F-A-S-T, and you can learn the signs of a possible stroke. Um, Hannah, thank you. Very, very much Thank for coming. Thank you for having in. me. And Nancy. And, and I want to throw in that. Uh, sorry, I, don't, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I want to <laughs> throw in that uh, April, or May is also Stroke Awareness Month. That's right. So while EMS Week is is kind of mid May, mid May, mm -hmm. the entire month is uh, Stroke Awareness Month. So um, it's really when you'll see kind of an increase in that awareness piece. Um, so hopefully. Um, with this and all the other education pieces that will happen during the month, um, we can increase that um, awareness. Before we run out of time here on LFR and uh, on LNK, we want to give some props. Uh, awards were recently handed out. They were. To men and women of Lincoln Fire and Rescue. And uh, Captain Scott Weeb is the 2021 Doug Wells Memorial Firefighter of the Year. We've had Doug on the show, I believe, in March. He was here with Dr. Jason Kruger. Uh, Scott was. Scott yep. was. Yes, yes. Scott Weeb. Scott yep. was here. Scott yep. Weeb. Yep. And uh, Scott named the Lincoln Fire and Rescue 2021 Firefighter of the Year. Also want to give props to Captain Sean Mahler, mm -hmm. Fire Captain Mahler, and Firefighter Jason Moss. They were awarded the VFW Post 131 Firefighter and Firefighter EMT of the Year. Awesome. Way to go. And then Kim McKay. Kim received the Fire Chief's Award of Excellence. I understand that Kim is a behind the scenes person and keeps uh, incredible organization and attention to yep. detail. She's been with the organization for uh, 30 or better years. I, I don't know the exact number, but she was a, a field um, person and was a, actually a fire captain and then moved into the training division and then moved over to the, the, um, the non-fire side. Mm -hmm. And she keeps us Spread away. <laughs> she's, she's a rock. Keeps you in order. Okay. That's right. And then, uh, another big one. For 25 consecutive years, Lincoln Fire and Rescue has received accreditation. Awesome. They recently received number 25, Accredited Agency Award. Take us in the significance of Oof. that. It would, be, it would be an entire show to talk about what goes into receiving that award. It would. Um, you know, it, it's a lot of improvement. It's, it's constantly looking at ways that we can get better. 
and ways that we can improve our system and ways that we can improve our department. So there are delineated markers um, for different areas of the fire department and you have to meet all of those little markers in order to be um, given that award. So uh, we're very proud of being an accredited agency and we were one of the first in uh, the United States to get it. And Scott talked about this back in the MARS program. It starts with the, dis the dispatchers. Mm -hmm. It starts with the uh, Lincoln Fire and Rescue. It starts with CHI mm -hmm. and uh, St. E's mm -hmm. and Bryan. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a chain and the link, the weakest link in that chain, Scott finds it and Jason <laughs> right. finds it and others find it and talk about it and improve it and correct it. And that's right. why we're so fortunate. That's why for 25, quarter of a century, folks, uh, about half as long as we've been doing this, twice as long as we've been doing this show here on LNK, Lincoln Fire and Rescue has been an accredited agency receiving an award. So we're very lucky in our community. Mm -hmm. Every month we take the time to go into the world of Lincoln Fire and Rescue. We appreciate every month you viewing and watching and uh, learning something. I learn something every time I sit down with someone from Lincoln Fire and Rescue. That's a great opportunity that I have, a privilege that I have. So thanks, everybody, for listening to us on LFR on LNK. I'm Dale Johnson.